to the first event of the Library Associates Program of the Year, coincident with the first Friday Afternoon Music Series Program of the Year. Some of you may wonder why the librarian is helping to introduce this performance. It's because we've had a collaboration with the Department of Performing Arts for six or seven years now, and we jointly sponsored this first event, which we think is wonderful. It's also an opportunity for us in the library to showcase for some of you who may not know them the fact that we have wonderful resources on music and about music in the library's Special Collections Research Center. And you'll hear about that more in a moment. This year, we have a particular pleasure. We're going to hear a concert based on a book edited by two members of our music faculty, Anthony Deldona and Anna harwell Chalenza. Their book, Music as Cultural Mission, Explorations of Jesuit Practices in Italy and North America, contains several items from the library's music-related special collections, and we'll hear some of those items performed today. Professor Dildano will talk about this. Several items from the book, the originals, are also on display in the library's third floor exhibit area, and we hope in Lauriger that you will come by and visit at any time. And best of all, you have an opportunity to buy the book by Professors Chalenza and Dildano right after this performance, and if pressed, I'm sure they'll even sign a copy to you. I'd like to thank all of the people who are involved in making this performance today possible. First, of course, to our musicians who will give us a splendid concert. Uh, to Anthony Delgona, Anna Harwell Chalenza, Laura Mertens of the uh, Department of Performing Arts who are hosting us today and to the members of the library staff who put together these events, particularly Dr. John Bookdahl, head of special collections, Jenny Smith, and Grace McKinney. Finally, I want to say that we are also, all of us, indebted at Georgetown to the late Leon Robin, who was the class of 1922 at Georgetown, and who at the time of his death, at the age of 101 and a half, was the oldest living alumnus of the university. He had a far-sighted view of the importance of establishing endowments, and it was his materials as well as funds that enabled us to establish the endowment that brings together programs such as this today. Finally, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see students, faculty, friends, and members of the Jesuit community who are here to enjoy what's going to be a great concert. It's my pleasure to introduce now Dr. John Buchtel, head of the Special Collections Research Center, who will give you a brief overview of what it is you may be hearing. John. Thank you all for coming. The University <coughs> Archives present, preserves documentation of musical activities over the course of Georgetown's long history. Sheet music, photographs, manuscripts, and letters by Georgetown faculty and Maryland Jesuits. Collections such as these provide opportunities for class visits and student research, so that Georgetown undergraduates can gain a tangible experience of history, working directly with primary sources. The richness of our special collections <coughs> enables us to collaborate closely with faculty across the university, and we're especially <coughs> delighted to be able to support the, Friday, the first Friday music concert each fall. The extraordinary generous and far-sighted endowment created by our late alumnus, Leon Robin, has allowed us not only to add to these collections, but also to create an exhibition space in which we can showcase some of these wonderful materials. Because the Robin Gallery is currently under renovation together with the rest of the special collections, we've installed this fall's display, as Artemis mentioned, in the Stephen Richard Curbs Gallery on the third floor of Lowenger Library, right next to the circulation desk. Please do come have a look. Anthony Deldona and Anna harwell Chalenza and their collaborators on their new book have done extensive research on the integral role music has played in the history of Jesuits' approach to culture. Today's concert will showcase examples they have drawn not only from discoveries they have made outside our collections, but also from resources in the Georgetown University Archives. We would like to give special thanks to University Archivist Lynn Conway, 
for her support in identifying and providing access to these materials, and to Stephanie Hughes and Dave Hagen for their assistance in the exhibition. Thank you. So first, thank you to everyone, Artemis, John, Lynn Conway, um, my colleague Anna Jones in the music program, and of course um, the ensemble today. A special thanks to my colleague, our colleague, excuse me, Fred the Bigholder, director of ours here at Georgetown, who really took on this um, project when we first started discussing uh, it as a collaborative endeavor with special collections and of course the first Friday Music Concert Series. And uh, I want to thank our students who you'll hear are wonderful in every way possible. And they actually took this on uh, over the summer, um, received the music and started working on it. And we, as most of you know, we've only been back for a short amount of time. So the timeline has been narrow and they've done a wonderful job. I want to thank our guests. Well, Dr. Jin Sun Cho is a member of our faculty here um, at Georgetown, Amy Dominguez on cello, and Risa Browder on violin, our wonderful ensemble that will be playing the first half of um, the concert today. So very briefly, as uh, John Buttel um, told you, that you're going to hear music that may not seem like it goes uh, well together on the surface. The first half of the concert, um, takes us back to early 18th century Naples, 1705, and a work that I recovered in 2008, uh, an oratorio, a sacred opera, Triunfo per la Sunzione della Santissima Vergine, Triumph of the Most Blessed Virgin. It was written for the Feast of the Assumption, August 15, at a time in which the cause of the Blessed Virgin Mary was being forwarded within the char uh, church hierarchy. Now, it fit very well within the society's purview, this constant engagement with the outside world. Historically, I think the society has had an unfortunate reputation of not being um, open um, to music, but the, the, the contrary was, it was quite the opposite. From the very beginning, the society encouraged the cultivation of music as part of its cultural mission, whether it was a liturgical, devotional, or even purely entertaining. Why Naples? Why the kingdom of Naples? Well, you have to think of it within 18th century terms. It is the second largest city in Europe, 300,000 residents, only Paris is larger, 500 churches, more than three, um, uh, excuse me, uh, more than 500 churches, there are five Jesuit colleges <coughs> in the city of Naples alone that follow very quickly in the wake of the first school in Messina, educating thousands of students per year, four and 5,000 students per year are entering these schools and getting this broad-based humanistic um, education of which music is a critical part. But Naples was also the preeminent city of entertainment in the early modern period. Uh, theaters, um, uh, as I mentioned, the churches, uh, other religious orders like the oratorians and the theatines, all cultivating music. The composer, uh, Nicola Ceva, was actually a priest. He was not a Jesuit. Um, there's very little information I could find about him, but he was a part of a sodality, a congregation of laity and clergy devoted to Mary, the Congregazione dei Mercanti, the Congregation of Merchants, that collaborated with the principal Jesuit College of Naples, the Seminary of Nobles, and they had a regular calendar of musical performances. The primary um, journal or newspaper of Naples, the Gazette di Napoli, is filled with notices about musical performances within Jesuit circles. And I was fortunate enough to find this oratorio in 2008, and this began a process with Anna where we wanted to put together a conference that looked at music within the cultural mission of the society. And we had a conference in Italy, and um, 
we continue to sort of discuss this idea. The book itself is very different. It's not conference proceedings. It's very different uh, from the original idea that we had on this topic. Um, I was saying to, to Professor Chalenza beforehand, I'm very proud of this book because most collections of essays maybe present three or four original new material. I can, we can honestly say that every essay is truly original, truly new. It's not synthetic material. You're reading about these uh, composers, this music for the very first time. So the music itself, as I said, it's an oratory or a sacred opera. I've come to the conclusion, which I write about in my portion of the book, that uh, it was not only destined for the Seminary of Nobles, but that a student wrote the libretto, the poetry, which again treats the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And with the exception of one of the roles, I think that the music was written expressly for students of the college. As Professor O'Malley, who should be warmly thanked, always says to me, learning is doing, and that's very much a part of the Jesuit charism. This is an unusual oratorio for early 18th century because almost all oratorios in the 18th century are allegorical in nature. This is an oratorio where Mary speaks in the first person. She is the protagonist, describing the end of the, her life and her hope for her assumption. That never happens in the early 18th century oratorio. So it's very clearly a catechism as well. And I think of it through the, the lens of the spiritual exercises and the composition of place. You are placing yourself within the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the three other characters have a dialogue with her. So follow the text. They're presented in translation, and you can follow some of the narrative from this oratorio, which is about two hours long in its entirety. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Just in a few, okay? So I've said way too much. Once again, I want to thank everyone, and again, a special thanks to Professor John O'Malley, who's over here, without whose help, we could have not brought this, this volume to publication and to fruition, the idea and the concept. So without further ado, Nicolo Cheva, Triumpho Pelo Sunzione della Santissima Vergine, our wonderful professionals, and Georgetown University students.
He was offered many. Um, but he felt that the method of worship, and in the, in, the inaugural, in the address when he is given this, he's given it not only because he's a great musician, but because he has offered a soothing palette of music for those exiles who <coughs> had to leave their home. Um, and this is an important part because music at Georgetown also healed, it also brought the community together. So, um, for an example, the first two songs, or <coughs> not songs, piano works that you're going to hear on this piece, uh, these were both done by, uh, uh, written, composed by a faculty member here in the mid-19th century named Pedro Adnaldes. Uh He was a fabulous keyboard player, um, was the first to bring virtuosic organ playing to Georgetown was adamant that every official event at Georgetown have music, and that the music and that the students participate and perform that music. Um, and another important thing he did is he brought in a new tradition of the St. Cecilia Day Festival every year, where all the students gathered together, and they had not only important uh, musical performances, because St. Cecilia is the patron saint of music, but they also had debates and discussions about what was important in culture right now. For example, in 1873, they debated women's rights, uh, along with musical entertainment to go along. So the idea that Dallas had was that music is important to helping students know how to do public speaking. Learning music also will help you connect with people, communicate with people. So that's what we're going to hopefully have in this next half, which I know we will. Um, the first piece I just wanted to uh, connect it with, how does it connect with the community? Um, this was written for the visitation, so the girls' school next door. Um, and each movement is a representation of uh, one of the students there. And this was performed by Georgetown students as a gift to visitation. Pedro Dalmas also, if we go into the archives of Georgetown University, we find huge volumes that he put together of music that represent all the religious practices in the area. So we have Quaker, we have not only Catholic, we also have various Protestants. So he tried to bring all of those different religions, practices together at Georgetown through music. So the first piece was for the visitation students. The second piece is for the Philodemic Society. It's the Philodemic Grand March. And in both of these, um, the first was written in 1834, the second one in 1854, you get a sense of um, American classical music.
and music activities stop. Uh, and one of the things I found when I was working in the archives here, which was one of those moments when you had the hair stand up on the back of your neck, is in a box in the archives, uh, there were these little leather-bound part books that go on the front of your instrument, like if you're in a marching band. And inside was a letter and an explanation. These are all handwritten. I was a student named John Wagner. He came back right after the war. And one of the first things he did was ask for student volunteers because he wanted to put together musicians to march in Abraham Lincoln's funeral. Mm -hmm. And he got a ton of volunteers. And in, in, along with these park books, he lists each student participated and where they were from, what state, north or south. So this was one of the first musical events that happened. A few months later, they had the St. Cecilia Festival for the first time in a number of years. And I just wanted to read you a quote because another one of those hair-raising moments in the archives was when I found this handwritten speech that a student named Sam Anderson presented when they renewed this festival. Quote, it has been the custom with the students and professors of Georgetown College to celebrate this day, St. Cecilia's Day, with a pleasant and joyful entertainment. But for, but for four sad and weary years, the flaming hand of war has swept over our beloved land, blasting everything with its fiery touch. For four long years, carnage and destruction have prevailed. Excitement and confusion have reigned supreme, and this good old custom was suffered to slumber. But now that the fiery scourge has passed away, now that the passions which urged man on to conflict and induced brother to battle against brother have been stilled by the gentle hand of peace, we have gathered again together one more time to revive this custom and to celebrate a day of so much honor and glory in common with our companions, which are here from the north, the south, the east, and the west. It is for this purpose, then, my friends, that you have left the busy world and consented to join with us for a short time in our ceremony. So to conclude to today's concert, I'd like to have a couple of these uplifting tunes performed. Um, these are from slightly later. The first one is Rose of Delta Sig. This was written by uh, a Georgetown student in 1924. You will definitely hear that 1924 love song style. And then finally to close out, uh, a tune called The Blue and Gray, which was written by a Jesuit father with um, text by a student. <coughs> it was written in 1918, and you'll notice we've given you sheet music because at the very end we're going to have a sing-along. And as you see, pay attention to the words. This was written in 1918, and it is welcoming back to campus all of those students who had stopped their, their education to go fight in the war.